We're ready to get started, everyone. Well, all I can say is that was an amazing morning. What an excellent keynote. Um, we had a great panel uh, session. Uh, my head is swimming with all of the good information and themes that we heard today. I'll just run over a few. Pace, plan, and proficiency. Um, right goals for the right purpose. Boost intelligence. Misalignment of infrastructure. Uh, eliminate uh, disparities and inequities. So those are lots of things. There's probably 25 more things that came out of the morning. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, really energized and excited. Um, <clears throat> so we hope you enjoyed the break as well. And now what we'd like to do is to move to the next part of the program and uh, talk about our vision for LOINC. Uh, earlier in the year, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of LOINC, which is a, a tremendous milestone. Um, <clears throat> and it's 30 years of all of us working together to improve data and interoperability for better care and better health. Um, uh, that was a time to reminisce. Uh, what we'd like to do now is take some time to look forward and talk about where LOINC is, is going next. I'm going to talk about um, where we are headed strategically, and then Stan Huff, who chairs the Clinical Lloyd Committee, will talk about where we're going strategically from a different perspective. And then he's going to talk some more about the concept model, which is, of course, very important to the work that we're doing. So, so to give you some background, LOIC stewardship and even uh, UCOM stewardship, for that matter, happens in the Health Data Standards Unit at the Regan Street Institute. In 2023, our unit began um, drafting a strategic plan, which aligns with the core values and goal statements of the Regan Street uh, Strategic Plan. Our plan draws on the, under, on the understanding that there has been tremendous work um, and advancement in, health, in the healthcare space since LOINC came on the scene in 1994, uh, the gains in technology and innovation since that time are significant. Uh, one clear example of that is FIRE and the tremendous impact it's had on our work. Uh, and we know that as we continue to advance, um, the resources that we need to continue uh, must also evolve. Taking all of that into account, our strategic plan has three primary goals. The first is we want to expand and sustain our worldwide leadership role that we have cultivated since 1994. Uh, we also wanted to continue to make progress in innovation and technology. And of course, it's imperative that we develop and align our resources to meet the needs of where we are at the moment. Um, each of these goals has strategies, and I'll just briefly go over those so you have an idea. Um, to expand and sustain our leadership role and uh, world and role worldwide in data standards and the informatics realm, we want to continue to provide leadership in key standards bodies and key projects to enable the integration and adoption of LOINC. And some of examples of that is our work with HO7, the HO7 Gravity Project, our work in HO7 Governance and Leadership, and our continuing work in initiatives that many of you are familiar with, like SHIELD, JIC, LIVID, and LEADER. And we will provide a legend for some of you who are not uh, uh, familiar with those acronyms because our realm is full of acronyms. Uh, it's also important that we partner uh, whenever necessary with other terminology developers uh, to achieve worldwide adoption and global interoperability. And a prime example of this is the work, uh, our, <clears throat> excuse me, our work with Snowman, um, which I describe as an important collaboration, um, a necessary collaboration. We've heard Stan describe it as a fun collaboration, and I would agree with that description. 
And uh, we have a special session on Thursday to talk more about that. We also want to uh, routinely engage with policymakers. That's what our previous session was about, um, such as you know our work with ASTONC, USCDI, NLM, FDA, et cetera. And since LOINC uh, is used across the globe in more than 170 countries, we want to routinely engage with ministries of health and other countries as well to support the adoption of LOINC and other standards. Our goal to, to continue to advance technology and innovation is a key focus for us right now. A lot has changed, as I mentioned before, since uh, LOINC was uh, <clears throat> created in 1994. Some of these changes have um, been influenced by two decades of value-based care. We heard about some of that this morning, um, which we know has fostered a demand for higher quality data and a demand for capabilities like effective uh, interoperability. At Regan Street, we monitor these trends um, <clears throat> and work to ensure that LOINC is responsible, aligned, and relevant. And as such, uh, we plan to modernize our concept model, uh, our technical infrastructure, and our tooling. So in, I apologize for that. In terms of aligning resources to meet the moment, uh, we want to build a cadre of industry partners to collaborate with. And we'd like to provide more sophisticated education and implement, implementation guidance and services either directly or indirectly through partnering, et cetera. So I've just uh, shared a sort of a snapshot of our vision as outlined in our strategic plan. Um, and what we'd like to do now, okay, is uh, focus on the innovation and technology part of our, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, strategic plan and drill down uh, on the mission critical part of our plan. And that is about the modernization of the LOINC concept model. Our concept model is at the very core of, um, of how we standardize clinical observations. And it's the foundation of LOINC's critical contribution to the data standards landscape. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Stan, who's gonna share some additional perspectives on vision, he comes at it from a different angle, and our thoughts on updating the concept model. Stan? Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I've been impressed uh, with the conference. Um, I just want to recognize and thank Marjorie and April, especially, and but all of the all of the link staff for such uh, an insightful and innovative uh, opportunity and to visit here. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to, as Marjorie said, I'm I'm going to focus sort of on technically what we have to do to 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 get to greater interoperability. I would echo some things that we already heard today about misaligned incentives and other things. The way. The way I describe it, when people ask, well, what's the biggest barrier to interoperability? It's the lack of incentive. It's a lack of money uh, to do it well and to do it right. <clears throat> you think about where we're at. <clears throat> In the US, we have, we're spending $4 trillion on healthcare. And for the lack of fundamental terminology and understanding of of the data we don't control that we don't we don't take good care of people uh without that and the thought is you know if i mean we're talking about uh dust on the books to support the terminology work as compared to how much money we're losing because we don't manage what we have because we don't understand the data and can't share the data. That's the single biggest problem. So I'm going to acknowledge that up front, and then I'm going to talk in a little different vein, uh, but nevertheless, I think important. So uh, I'll just jump in. So 
I'm reminded from uh, this this quote from Charles Dickens. You know, the the worst of times, the best of times. Uh, and it goes through. Uh, I you know, and I remembered that key word, and then when I looked it up, then it was followed by all of the rest of these things, which really intrigued me. You know, it's the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. It's the you know belief, incredulity, light, darkness. It's all of that. You know. Uh, we're uh, we're in a situation where we've got opportunities and 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 then we're in desperate need. Uh, so that's that's sort of the uh, it jumped out to me is is the situation that we're in. So how, what what is the part of this that's that's the best of times? So uh, just thinking back, uh, you know my how far we've come uh, in computing. My first interaction with a personal computer, if you will, was uh, a programmable HP calculator that I got to play with in high school. Uh, and, you know, just the evolution. I mean, there were mainframes and then there were personal computers and Apple and Mac. And I mean, and now we have, you know, more compute power on our watches than we than than whole hospitals had, you know, back then. And when I started this, uh, Snowmed was a book, okay? <laughs> it, was, it was published in three volumes. Uh, and uh, so we, we've come a tremendous, you know, just looking at, at, at the evolution there. Uh, so uh, putting that in perspective, I mean, the computer science part is one of the advances that we've made. One of the things, uh, you know, all kinds of neural network, AI, Bayesian networks, uh, NLP, uh, just tremendous capability, amazing capabilities that we, we didn't have. And then the development of standards, and, and you're probably all familiar with that. Uh, but also the political environment with, with increasing understanding and support of interoperability by providers and software vendors and professional societies and educational institutions, et cetera. And then we've had significant improvement advancements in legislation, regulation, policy, public policy related to these things, all of which make this the best of times in, in many ways. Uh, you think about uh, sort of how, how this is working. Uh, you know, we had HL7 uh, version two compliance, uh, and then, and, and that really, uh, standardized structure, but not the terminology that was used in, in the initial versions. Uh, and then we got fire and, and we have uh, greater structure uh, specification to use LOINC codes and SNOMED codes and other things that were actually part of fire and, and then uh, also supported through regulation uh, through uh, uh, CMS and ONC and, and those kind of things. And then you've got specific projects like the Argonauts and others that are working in specific domains and trying to apply that knowledge in a specific area. But what I'm trying to get to, and I'll describe more what I mean, is semantic interoperability, where uh, we have one preferred way to represent data of, of, of the same type. And that's the thing that is sort of the final mile to really recognize the true value of, of interoperability. So when I say plug and play interoperability or semantic interoperability, what I mean is that the data is structured and understood in such a way that I can build an application and for that application then could be, and, and when I say application, it could be a data entry application, it could be a data collection sort of thing, it could be clinical decision support. It could be analytics. It could be, uh, you know, population analytics or uh, any of those things. I'm talking very broadly, any kind of program that is useful within healthcare and health-related activities. If I create an application like that, if we have defined the standards in such a way uh, that, that is stable enough that that application can be used uh, anywhere the standard is supported. So I don't have to take, if I'm, I'm gonna take that 
say, uh, a sepsis detection algorithm from one HR to another HR in different organizations, we have established uh, an understanding of the data representation in such a way that application needs absolutely no configuration or changes or local mapping or anything to run in that new environment. Uh, so it the, the easiest thing is to liken it to what we have with the iPhone and and uh, with uh, a Android. Uh, you just go to the app store and you find apps and you see how many stars it has and you download it and it runs. I don't have to do a whole bunch of configuration. I don't, that's, that's what we need in healthcare. That's what I want in terms of semantic interoperability because it's life, uh, it have life impact for us to start sharing knowledge as executable programs as opposed to uh, what we're doing now. So that's what I mean by plug and play. It truly is plug and play. I don't have to reconfigure. I don't have to map. I don't have to. We've got a long ways to go to get there. But uh, just graphically, that's, you know, it says what we're doing now is we're doing point to point interfaces from everything. They're all different. We spend money and time doing all of those. We want to get to the situation where there's, uh, if you will, in that cloud in the second diagram, uh, what, what that cloud is, is that common representation of data. And we can all communicate to that and, and get data and contribute data through that. And then, uh, as you can imagine, that reduces the work incredibly uh, to be able to go through a common representation of that, of that data. So uh, it's the worst of times. Um, so uh, this is an interesting quote that I found uh, medicine used to be simple and ineffective and safe, relatively safe. And now it's complex, effective, and potentially dangerous. Uh, we have knowledge. We have new drugs. If we don't apply them in the right areas, we hurt people. If we don't apply them when they should have been applied, we hurt people. Uh, and so uh, that's that's just a challenge. And that's, you know, a lot of what Dr. Ehrenfeld talked about is where, you know, where we're not quite doing things. So how does it work today? Uh, and why is this the worst of time? So we do research, we do observational uh, sort of studies. We, we, learn, we learn things. Those things get published in textbooks. We teach them in medical school. They're uh, in textbooks and published, you know, peer-reviewed uh, literature. Uh, and uh, then uh, we try and have clinicians read those books and textbooks and articles, absorb that knowledge, and then apply that knowledge when they see a patient. Okay? It doesn't work. It will never work because we're fallible as, as humans. The, the evidence that it doesn't work is multiple studies have shown uh, that on average, 250,000 people die a year from preventable medical errors. Now, let that sink in. Uh, if you do the math, that means today. Over 600 people will die today of preventable medical errors. Now, for some reason, that doesn't get attention. I, I think it's understandable why it doesn't get attention, because it happens one thing here and one thing there. If this was... If these were jetliners crashing and everybody on the jetliners died, uh, this would be front page news. But the fact that it happens, you know, once once here in Utah and once here in Nevada and someplace else in Wisconsin and someplace else, it's all scattered and nobody nobody sees it except the families of the individuals who die, uh, and they're often not aware because uh, they don't know what actually happened and why it happened. Uh, they just know that a loved one is gone. Uh, so uh, that's, it's just astounding to me that that doesn't create more awareness, though, in the public of, of what the challenge is. Uh, other studies have shown, and this was actually on, you know, Dr. Ehrenfeld's slide, 
you know, with the signs and symptoms, his, his number was that uh, the doctors got it right about 60% of the time. Uh, other studies, so basically it's a coin flip, whether you're going to get the right advice from a physician about your, your diagnosis. Now, I'm a physician, and I, and, and I want to hasten to add, this is not because they're uh, incompetent, not because they don't have good intent. They want to take good care of their patients. Every physician I know wants to take good care of their patients. We haven't given them the tools to do things the best way that they can. So uh, these are just some quotes from, from notable people that, that you would probably know uh, that just reinforce this idea. Uh, again, David Eddy, the complexity of medicine now exceeds the, the, the limit, limitations of, of the human mind. Uh, Clem has said, man's not perfectible. It doesn't matter if you, the, you, you can't change medical schools to make us have perfect, perfect memories. There's no way that anybody, no matter what kind of mind they have, can remember everything that they need to take care of the patient and be able to apply that knowledge to the next patient who comes in. The other part of that is not even about memory and things. It is, we were up all night. We, got, we, we make mistakes because we're tired, we're fatigued, we're overburdened, we're filling out EHR records in the middle of the night. Uh, and, and that causes errors in and of itself, just from the fatigue. Uh, <clears throat> The, the other one that's, that's uh, I think, is strong and, and maybe is meaningful expression is from, from Larry Weed, who said, uh, a culture of denial subverts the healthcare system from its foundation. So you don't see people talking about how do we, how do we change society to do this? Uh, somehow we're just accepting of, of the uh, errors that we make and uh, don't do it. So. Uh, and, and then a slightly different part is just the estimation of waste uh, from this. So not only are we hurting people, but we're wasting resources because we order tests that don't need to be ordered or we order the wrong tests or we give the wrong medications. And it's estimated that 25% 20 of that $4 trillion. So a trillion dollars a year is in waste because we don't do it. We don't do it correctly. So, um, what, what we want is then to use those computer resources and enable that semantic interoperability so that uh, we can extend the natural capabilities of physicians, nurses, uh, all those who care for patients. So um, some people would say, and I've, I've seen in the medical literature, doctors say, well, it can't be, the, you know, the, the in, in the CDC, you don't see, uh, you know, the fact that preventable medical errors is the third leading cause of death. That's because it's not reported. <laughs> okay. Uh, it does, it's, it's really hard to, it's really hard to figure it out. Uh, but I can tell you as a physician, number one, unfortunately, I've been in the situation where I didn't know what I needed to know and I caused the death of patients. Now that, obviously the, the most serious problem with that is to the patient and the family who lost a loved one. That kind of error though has an impact on healthcare workers as well. I mean, I think about those people that, that I didn't do the right thing because I didn't know, not because I didn't love them, not because I didn't want to do it. I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, and so, uh, other things just in my family members, a daughter who had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, it went misdiagnosed for four years because she was rheumatoid factor negative. And so those of you who are kind of related to this know that almost, almost everyone is rheumatoid factor positive. So if you go to a general practice physician, they, they order the rheumatoid factor, they order the other tests. And then if that rheumatoid factor comes back negative, they go, I'm not sure what's going on here. Maybe this is a psychological problem. Maybe this is psychosocial, you know, so, psycho, uh, physical, physical uh, kind of problem. Uh, that's, what, that's what us physicians do is if, if we don't know an explanation, then it must be something in your head. 
you know. Uh, but it turned out, you know, we finally got to a specialist. She ordered and said, yeah, well, she's obviously got, uh, you know, by, by additional laboratory testing, she obviously has rheumatoid arthritis. And so then she started getting the right treatment. Uh, my, my father uh, had rheumatic fever as a, as a young adult uh, and had, you know, heart trouble. He, he didn't, he had valvular disease from that. He lived a full life until he was about six years old, so, and then he was diagnosed with quote unquote asthma. And he was treated for asthma for five years when what he really had is the early part of congestive heart failure. Uh, my brother uh, had uh, uh, parathyroid disease, actually parathyroid tumor. And so he was, he was having kidney stones every three to six months for literally 15 years. And they never did the right study to know that he had this parathyroid condition and, uh, you know, finally went to uh, the Mayo Clinic. They figured it out. They took it out. You know, so my own personal experience basically validates all of those statistics that I'm talking about. Um, so what's the answer to this? So uh, I come from a culture uh, at Intermountain Healthcare where we have literally hundreds of clinical decision support applications. And this is a list of a bunch of them where uh, better, uh, better ordering of antibiotics, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, ventilators and, and actually program managed ventilation management, uh, et cetera. And there are a whole, whole list of things there. Uh, and every one of these things are articles in the peer reviewed literature that say, yes, it improved the quality of care and not, and, and, and surprisingly in a sense, uh, also decreased the cost. And that's because this isn't like manufacturing. In manufacturing, for instance, if you if you want to build a better car, you may need better steel, you may need better rubber tires, you may need better engineering. That all costs money. And so, you know, if you will, better cars cost more money. In this case, if you take better care of people, you have reduced costs because you're giving the right medication. You're only giving it for the time that the patient needs it. They get out of the hospital sooner. Uh, you have shorter length of stay. Uh, so this is this is a situation where uh, providing high quality care actually costs less than providing bad care. Um, so that that should be the the answer. And okay, yeah, it is an answer. But the challenge is, and this came out of uh, uh, a session at uh, the International Medical Informatics Association meetings in, in Lyon, France. Uh, a few years ago, uh, some of the uh, world leading experts, uh, pioneers in advanced decision support, uh, like uh, Kazimir Kulikowski and Robert Greenis and Ted Shortliff and Don Detmer and, and others, others would have been there if they'd been alive, uh, said the biggest challenge is not creating the decision support logic. The biggest challenge is being able to take that knowledge and apply it in a new environment, in a new hospital, in a new, uh, in a different hospital system. Because so, and you can go to AMIA, you know, the AMIA fall meeting every year and, and their reports and their accurate reports and exciting reports about decision support that has been created. Follow the history of those. They may continue to be used uh, at the given institution, oftentimes they're not used in the given institution any longer than the person is at the institution who created it. And it doesn't get to someplace else. Uh, and it's because for the lack of interoperability. Uh, so the biggest challenge with getting clinical decision support tools in place for people is interoperability, the ability to share that knowledge as an executable program. So artificial intelligence, it's already been talked about. I, won't, I don't have too much to add here, so I won't say much, but it's also uh, in its own little microcosm. You know, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times because of its capabilities, but then the things that we need to watch for and 
they mentioned transparency this morning and and other things but there's a there's a tremendous opportunity there as well so what are the barriers and what do what do we want to do about this um, so interoperability today is 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 sort of craziness uh you know the same thing happens in the real world and then based on which ehr we have and what our technology is doing the data at its inception has different structure and uses different codes all of the all of the ehrs use their own internal codes for this kind of data and so when you want to use it downstream uh, for public health or for research or observational or uh, surveillance uh, in the marketplace, then what you have to do is you have to uh, transform it. And so those little gears represent software that you have to put in place that transforms the data from the way it was originally created to, quote unquote, a standard representation. Uh, now, what you'll notice, though, is that kind of trans transformation is hard. Not only does it take work and you have to create those gears, but it doesn't create perfect transformation of the data. There are subtle differences. You have information loss when you translate. Uh, Ed Hammond said, you know, uh, if you have two codes and they mean the same thing exactly, you don't need two codes, okay? If you have two codes and they mean different things, then, and, and, and you do a map, then you're gonna have information loss. Uh, because of the, the the differences in those things, and that's what often happens in in those in those situations. So what we're looking for is something like this. Okay, this is going to take a long time. Okay, it really means we have to change how we get data at the source. But uh, if we could do that, uh, I mean, literally, it would it, it it means billions and billions of dollars a year if we got to the point where when we collected data, it was in a, in a structured coded form that was semantically correct and semantically interoperable. Uh, that's what we're shooting for, is that to create data at the inception. If we can't create data at, at the point of collection uh, in exactly the way it should be represented, then what we want to do again is, is go to that common transformation and do that as, uh, as correct as we possibly can. But in either case, you need to define the target, okay? What is the representation of the data that you want to, that, that you want to tell people to, to convert to? Uh, not only if they're doing data collection, but if they're doing data collections and they're transforming data from its current form to, uh, to the standard form. What is that standard? Well, one of the challenges is that we have Fire and we have Loink and we have Snomed and Yukum and RX Norm. Uh, we have some exceptional standards and and I can't say enough good things about uh, Fire and and the work that's got on there and what's being done and how it's being encouraged by regulation by CMS and uh, ONC and the CDC etc. But the the bottom line is and and we're recognizing this, uh, is that if you use all of the standards that have been recommended, you still have multiple ways to represent the same data. And, and this is one example. There, there's a LOINC code that means the systolic blood pressure sitting. Uh, there's another LOINC code that just means this is a systolic blood pressure. And then you can send as a different part of the message you can send whether the patient, you know, the patient's position, whether they're sitting, whether they're laying down, uh, whether they're standing, et cetera. Uh, and this kind of duplicate capability, or if you will, multiple ways to say the same thing within the standards is ubiquitous, okay? Uh, you, you look at, uh, and, and, you know, they've done studies, uh, very nice studies from the FDA, Keith Campbell has been involved in that and others at the FDA to show that, oh, you, you look at the data that you, you ask for data, even through fire APIs, you get data back that's legally fire and it's using LOINC and it's using SNOMED, but you have these kind of differences in the representation and that makes it non-interoperable. It doesn't, it, it isn't plug and play interoperable. Uh, and so uh, that's a challenge. So. Uh, 
again, if you're using all of the standards, you have multiple ways to represent the same the same data. So uh, an illustration of this as well is shown by Mark Kramer from uh, MITRE, who looked at you know the number of fire profiles that are created. Fire profiles are created uh, as a specialization of the general fire resources. And, and what you can see here, for instance, is that uh, 74 different variations on patient. And you look at the number, you know, fire allows extensions. So they're, they had an 80-20 rule and they only put in, 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 the, in the standard itself, if you will, the, the core part of the standard is uh, targeted at making sure that 80, per, you know, that, that things that 80% of the people are using are in there, and then there's another 20%, those are accounted for by making extensions. Well, those extensions are created separately and differently, and so that, that contributes. Uh, this is just basically a statistical way of saying uh, the same thing, that there are multiple ways, even if you're using the standards, to represent the same information. So uh, this is just me ranting and whining now. Uh, but we're in the situation, this, is, this comes back to the worst of times things, you know, it's like we're trying to build a house. We don't have a measuring tape. Uh, we're, we're trying to share knowledge before there was a printing press. And so, you know, we're sharing things by trying to teach doctors in medical school and trying to keep them have a perfect memory uh, and it can't be done. Uh, you know, astrophysics before there were telescopes. Uh, chemistry, you know, before we had any understanding of uh, the atomic theory and atoms and molecules and the peri periodic table. Um, and, you know, another one is infectious diseases before there's a microscope. Uh, I have to share this. Uh, the uh, Before there were microscopes, the leading theory of why people got sick was sinning, okay? They, uh, some, some, and, and this really came at a, to a point uh, when the Panama Canal was being built. Panama Canal was happening, this, this, this was in the early 1900s. They actually knew and understood something about these things by that time. It wasn't known and understood by the Senate or the Congress or other people. Uh, and, and what would happen is that these bright, young, brilliant engineers would go down there and, and work on the Panama Canal, and then we'd get yellow fever or malaria and die. And what did their families think? My gosh, what didn't I know about them? What did they do to have this disease? Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, you know, you look at it and, but, and this is a total aside, you look at it today and you say, we're in the same situation with mental health. The most often thing now is, you know, somebody, well, just, you know, pull up your bootstraps, you know, don't, why are you depressed? Why, you know, why, anyway, we, we judge people based on uh, insufficient knowledge and we, we judge them based on our inability to understand or know or understand that. So, we're in that situation now because of that data disk, you know, we, we don't know what we're doing because we don't have the measuring stick. Uh, and the measuring stick is that we have to have codes and terms and structures that fundamentally represent what we can see and understand from the world that allow us to represent what we can observe from the real world. So how does LOINC fit into that? And it may be, may be obvious, but, uh, just just to review how this how this works at a very primitive level uh what we have are our five senses uh and then we have extended senses that that can measure electronic you know uh electrical voltages and uh wavelengths of light and other things but basically we have things you know where we can we can see color visual intensity size uh we can feel heat we can feel pain we can do all of that kind of stuff those things then uh, result in our ability to, for instance, say, oh, you know, based on looking at your throat, you've got redness in there, uh, you know, uh, 
pain, you can say I've got a sore throat or I've got a sore shoulder. Or I've got, you know, uh, so those that that first first level of things there with pain and sore throat and other things, those those are the first primitives and those are observations. Uh, and those are things that we want to assign white codes to. And then what happens is you get, uh, once you have that primitive observation, you can, you can take multiple observations and you can put those things together and infer additional information and say, oh, you got a red throat, you got a sore throat, you got cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, you know, that's an infl infl uh, inflammation process going on. Uh, you know, uh, you can say, well, there's an increased white count. We measured the white count, but now we know based, based on uh, normals uh, that that's an increased white count and temperature, they've got a fever, other things. You add that together and you can say, oh, right now they've got a streptococcal pharyngitis. You go on and you get even more data from, from an outside source and you say, oh, not only they have strep, but they're an immunocompromised patient. The point of all this is that the foundation of our knowledge is the ability to represent those base observations in an unequivocal, unambiguous, reusable way and have one preferred way to represent that information. Uh, and that's where LOINC comes in because LOINC is making the names of those observation codes and SNOMED is creating the values for those codes uh, if it's a coded, if it's a coded element, you know, if you're talking about signs and symptoms about redness and inflammation and pain and where the pain is, that's all of the purview of uh, the kind of terms and the body locations that things happened and all of the anatomic relationships, all of those things are in SNOMED. We're, we're, we're at the primitive part of this. And this is the part where I say, this is, this is the ruler. This is the ruler that we need. This is the telescope we need. This is the microscope that we need in order to do valid, accurate science within, uh, within healthcare. So uh, I just thought, fun quote from Confucius, the beginning of wisdom is the ability to call things by their right names. I could, pretty smart guy. Uh, so, uh, so part of the, Part of the conversion of this, or part part of what's needed, is a recognition between what I would call textbook knowledge versus executable knowledge, and 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 the distinction is described here. So textbooks would, for instance, would say about diabetes mellitus, they would say, you know, diabetes mellitus is a is a relative uh, lack of insulin that uh, secretion by the pancreas, which results in uh, increased levels of glucose in the bloodstream and ketones and blah, blah, blah. Okay. That doesn't help me at all when I'm trying to diagnose you. Executable knowledge is knowing, oh, if your hemoglobin A1C is up, I know you're diabetic. Uh, if actually, if, if it requires, if you're, if you have to take insulin to control your glucose, then you're diabetic. There are a set of rules, and I, you know, I've tremendously simplified here, but that's, if you will, executable knowledge. It says, what, what can I observe in the real world that tells me this patient is diabetic, or this patient has congestive heart failure, or this patient has asthma? Uh, that's that's the, the difference between, and we need both, you need both, but the executable knowledge is what allows you to apply the knowledge to a new patient who's coming to be seen by you. Uh, that's, that's what makes it uh, possible and doable. So LOINC is making the identifiers, names, and codes that, that identify the observations. And those things are coupled with value sets from SNOMED. And, and they're coupled with an information model that's provided by FHIR or by uh, CCDA or uh, other structural representations of the data. Uh, and uh, those things uh, are made available free for charge for the world to use. Um, I can't imagine, in a sense, anything that, that has greater value to society sort of in this domain uh, than, than being able to bring that kind of discipline to the world 
and make it freely available for the benefit of the world, not for the benefit of uh, you know an individual company or uh, an in, even an individual country. Uh, so loin codes are an essential part. I, I mean, there's I, I don't think there's any other way around it. So um, this comes back to, if you will, kind of the 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 political and social and uh, business aspects of getting this done. So in order to really get to semantic interoperability, again, I've, I've been talking about sort of the technical aspects of this, but uh, you need a community uh, that supports this, uh, that comes to meetings and, and provides the expert knowledge. You still have to get the expert knowledge from people and, and, and from other sources. Uh, and so then we need continued support of the standards. And by support, I really mean funding and people uh, because uh, none of this can get done. And as I said, we, we continue to make uh, mistakes in not funding this because it's, it's the thing that allows us to take the temperature of healthcare. It's the thing that allows us to learn from what we're doing. And if we don't pay attention to that, we'll just continue on killing 250,000 people a year out of ignorance. Uh, so uh, you, you need, along with the terminologies, you need structures like fire and fire profiles and CCDA and, and those other things. And then we need certification. We need to be able to test people to know whether they're actually adhering to the standards and whether the data is actually interoperable. Uh, and so, and then hopefully that enables an open marketplace so that knowledge now becomes, uh, uh, people can still make money by making a great algorithm, making a great program. Uh, but now that program can be used everywhere uh, without modification. So. Uh, what what would the future look like then? So, um, starting on the on the left hand side here, you know we're still going to do research. We're still going to observe uh, things. We're going to learn. We're going to make new drugs. We're going to do other things, and uh, we'll probably I I don't see you know publications going away, but what we want to see what would be new is that that knowledge gets immediately trans translated into an executable program. So if we're working on sepsis, it says, I learned lots of things about sepsis, about what kind of, you know, you need to measure lactic acid, you wanna look at their white count, you wanna know their signs and symptoms. Somebody has to figure that out. You, but when you, once you know that and understand it, along with publishing it in a book, you want to make a program that says, oh, when I see patients in the emergency room, I can run this program. And it knows whether this patient is at high risk or not high risk, it can suggest to me what should be done, whether I should, uh, you know, wh whether it's not a problem or whether I need to do additional tests or whether I need to give uh, bolus of IV fluids and antibiotics and uh, need to admit them to the hospital because they're at very high risk of, of sepsis. That application then once it's created and if it's truly interoperable, it can be implemented in uh, emergency rooms everywhere in Intermountain Healthcare, at the Mayo Clinic, at the Cleveland Clinic. But even more important is that it can be implemented where most of us go for our healthcare, which isn't one of those huge academic institutions. It's a 200 or 300 bed hospital close by. That's where most of the people are dying. They don't have IT resources. They don't have anything else. They, they don't have the ability that Intermountain does to have a staff of of, of IT and informatics specialists to implement these kind of uh, applications. And so uh, this is one of those things that can have a great impact on bias and equity and equitable care, because now the knowledge is not sequestered in uh, well-funded, high-profile institutions. It's knowledge now that gets to the bedside of every bed in every community hospital and in underserved and rural hospitals and in uh, you know, uh, economically depressed and talking about all of the uh, other biases and, and situations. This, uh, we, have to, we have to create it. It won't happen naturally, but we can watch for bias. We can adjust for bias. We can, and, and it becomes a part of an ever increasing knowledge base that belongs to, 
to humanity, not to an individual. And it's stated in a way that everybody understands it and can use it. So the way it could work, for instance, uh, this is very similar to uh, what happens, you know, uh, when I when I shop on Amazon. Uh, you know, I'm always seeing these little things that, based on prior purchases, other things say, "Hey, other people who bought this might be interested in, you know, uh, this," and they suggest, "Well, this this was even more sophisticated." You know, so a patient comes in, uh, a diabetic woman uh, with atherosclerotic heart disease, some other things. And the, the knowledge now can be applied to say, oh, these are things that you need to do for this patient. And you can bring up, make it easy. We talked about the burden on clinicians. We can make it easy for them to say, oh yeah, I need to know about their hemoglobin A1C. I, you know, I choose that. Oh yeah, I wanna, I, I wanna see a graph of what their glucose has been doing. I, I want to see uh, what diabetic med, meds are on and what level and what, what their uh, thing are. And I want to see their GFR. I want to see if they're starting to get into renal failure. You can make it trivially easy for a clinician to think about all of the things that, that he or she should think about when they're seeing the patient and just click on those things. And then the, it, it'll do that. It'll order them. You don't have to go to another screen and order, order those tests or do those things. Or just go to another screen and actually see the graph because it would be created, and all of the all of the data that was needed for that would be interoperable and and standardized. So, uh, and again, that relates back to that first diagram that you know that's that's possible because it's not only using the data for me that came from Intermountain, but it comes from uh, my the the office system and the physician that I'm seeing as my primary care doctor. It could incorporate data that came to me because I went to the University of Michigan for uh, a special test that wasn't available anywhere in Utah. All of that kind of thing. You create the interoperability. Now my record is comprehensive and complete. So, um, so what are the implications then for specifically for research? Uh, I'll go through these quickly because I know we're out of time. We appropriately give people academic credentials for creating publications and new knowledge and doing research. We should also provide academic credit for people who create executable knowledge uh, so that there's, 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 if you will, an academic incentive for people to do things better. Uh, for health education, I would take, you know, I, you see things, uh, if we had that kind of reliable uh, things, it would change medical education because you wouldn't now be trying to educate physicians to know everything, which is an impossible task and it will never be successful. What you do is teach clinicians to use information resources and to use executable knowledge to take care of their patients. And you teach them exquisite capabilities in terms of physical exam, in terms of patient interaction, in terms of reading body language and, and, uh, eliciting from the patient what their preferences are and how I can best serve them as, as a clinician and to discuss with them what their options are and what, what would work best for their circumstances. Uh, but it, changed, it, it would change dramatically. I would love to see an experiment like that, that where I go to medical school and what it teaches me is how to use chat GPT or some better, even better thing uh, or other kinds of information resources and have those programs running in the background that say, well, this, you, you know, we know this patient now has uh, nausea and vomiting. They have uh, uh, an increased white count. Uh, they haven't been feeling well. Uh, you need to be worried about sepsis. Uh, and you need to, these are the tests uh, that, that you need to order to look at that. And so you're teaching them how to use information management tools to take better care of patients and putting those tools into the environment where they happen automatically. Uh, so for society, we improve care, we decrease cost, uh, we do the right thing the first time, uh, we enable more you know, accurate medical AI because if you have that standardized data and the observations are accurate, the large language models and all of the AI and machine learning tools work better. Uh, and 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 become more reliable. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, 
you now make that knowledge available and you you do it in at, first of all you get it to the place where it's most needed which are in small rural hospitals and physicians offices and clinics and uh, we can work on in a very systematic way making health care equitable for all Ta-da, that's it <laughs> so uh, questions? Yeah. Oh. Whoops. Passed right by here. Thank you, Stan, for the excellent presentation. Um, if I may, I have two questions, completely different questions. Yes. And the first is more reflecting on the on the first part of your presentation and that is that you both mentioned that Loing should be a worldwide leader what was it a leadership role and in Europe we also see that the Scandinavian countries for example developed the NPU a different kind of standard which is difficult also again to map to Loing um, and I also noticed for example that the IFCC has a working group uh, for the NPU uh, standard but not for the Loing standard. Are there also this also things that uh, you try to work on? We we need to figure that out. Uh, you know, certainly I'm aware of NPU because Loink. I I don't know if you're aware of the history. NPU and Loink started from the same group of people, oh, and so no, so that. there was involvement of George Demore and uh, Tom Tom Fears and. Uh, and then especially Henrik Olsen uh, and his role in IUPAC. Uh, so for instance, all of the parts of LOINC that some of the, it was foundational theory for LOINC uh, because it was Henrik and IUPAC that said, oh, measurement theory, component system, you know, uh, and kind of property. Uh, that was all in common. And then there was a division of, of thought about, how much you pre and post coordinate those things. And that led to NPU versus LOINC. Uh, I understand that there's a, a, a joint project going on, you know, between NPU or SNOMED early, early project, uh, looking at incorporation or an ontology for NPU in the same sense, uh, data transformation, if you will, or model transformation, you know, in, into the SNOMED. So I, I applaud that uh, and, there's also, uh, you know, a very interesting program that's now going on with Kareem, uh, who's bringing together everybody uh, in the community to talk about what are the quote unquote principles for laboratory, you know, data standardization. And so certainly aware of NPU, I applaud the success. Uh, we need to work and see how we could unify that in some way. Uh, yeah, I think that is very important also because different standards is also not... Uh... It's difficult to inter to to exchange. Yeah. And then my second question is more about um, the slide you showed that, for example, for the blood pressure, you can um, yeah, you you can uh, put uh, your how do you say it if you're sitting into yeah. the loink or you snowmat. May you say that there are too many degrees of freedom in loink, perhaps, or because people can. That, or that it is an overlap between LOINC and SNOMED, which we should make more explicit. It's it's not it's not an overlap because SNOMED has the names of sitting and other things. And LOINC doesn't make codes for sitting. We have some answer lists, but they'll be replaced by SNOMED. So there's not overlap between LOINC and SNOMED in those things. There there is a little bit of overlap because some observables have been created in SNOMED. And of course, LOINC is pretty much all observables but uh we're working you know we have the the joint activity and that will just show even further the 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 way that if you will the role of observation codes versus the value of those observations when it's a coded observation which becomes the domain of snomed completely yeah yeah okay, okay. thank you yeah. i i think i have oh, here. Oh. Uh, what you're talking about is is transformative uh when you're talking about with ai it's almost 
magical uh, when you're saying, you know, I uh, have a patient, they come in with elevated um, A1C, here's the test you should do, this, these are the things you should talk about. It's, there's so many positives to that. What would you say though, that doing that would take away from the physician's diagnostic abilities, teaching, you know, knowing those basic things. And the reason I say that is I have a friend who teaches at the University of Iceland. She teaches computer programming first year. So at the end of the year, the, the kids have a test. Half the class passed the class, half didn't. The half that didn't had used all of the chat GPT for their homework. The other guys had actually put the sweat equity in and done the homework. So they had those basics. Do you think that approach that we need to be careful that the human relies too much on the technology and, and doesn't exercise the actual skills they should use to diagnose and treat a patient? Uh, yeah, they needed to continue the experiment and see whether the doctors who use chat GPT actually took better care of patients instead of passing the test. Uh, because the fact that they passed the test, what you I can tell you, a year from then, they wouldn't pass the test. They would have forgotten what they learned. And and I I spent all I, I did that, you know. You know, I, I spent, you know, four hours after midnight cramming for facts that they were going to ask me on the exam and if totally to no avail. So teaching people to think is a different thing than trying to get them to memorize things. I'm very much against memorization. I'm very much for teaching them to think, but that needs to be done in a different way. And it would fundamentally change, you know, medical school to do that. The other thing that's hinted at by your question, and, and this is my, this is my belief. There will come a time when the program for a given specific thing, and any, I, I would actually say this, any place where people have spent time to make a computer program to diagnose and treat a disease and spent sufficient time at it, the program becomes better than any individual clinician. So there will come a time when you're going to hurt people by letting the physician make decisions instead of using the best knowledge which would be applied. We're not there yet. We may be 10 years or 20 years or but that's coming. That's it's probably closer than I than I think. But you and there's there are advocates for this. Uh, a guy that I worked with called Alan Morris worked with this. What they found out is that uh, they could use closed loop decision logic to to manage ventilator settings in the ICU. They found out that the programs were better than individual clinicians. So if you let the clinicians manage the ventilators, they hurt and kill people that could be saved if they had applied the algorithms. And, and I think that's the future. It's not here now, but no, I'm not worried about I, what I'm worried about is that they won't use, they won't use the computers because the computers eventually will take better care of me than, than what an individual physician would do. I still need a physician. This isn't doing away with physicians. But now the role of the clinician is is communication and uh, you know understanding history and signs and symptoms and and being able to communicate with the patient about their preferences and um, all of that sort of social socialization part, as well as the ability to use the tools that are available to them. That's where I think it's going. So that. Hey, Stan, that's Rob over here. Hi. She's been waiting. She was oh. first in line and she did. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Rob. Okay. Um, so I, throughout the, the past couple of days, particularly today, actually, something's been nagging me that we kind of skirted around. It, but And it's often used when we talk about, oh, look at how if we just had Apple you know, or, or Android products or something like that, that people could just kind of use. And there's, there's a, an element to that, which is we didn't have the government tell everyone to go and buy a smartphone. You know, what happened was, is that there was something that was created that people wanted and they demanded it. And the other side to that nagging 
element to this problem that we're trying to solve for me is that I, for decades, felt like physicians were not controlling their own destiny. Clinicians were not controlling their own destiny. They weren't, and we talk a lot about this, that they're not involved in the decision-making about EHR. So not this, they're, they're not the ones that decide where the money's allocated with regards to quality assessment and decision support and things like that, which is a piece of this demand issue that's missing. And so, you know, my question would have been to some of the panelists, and particularly Dr. Oren, who, uh, I mean, Ehrenfeld, who, who was a fantastic uh, keynote, by the way, um, is how do we, <laughs> I'm asking the impossible question, but how do we fix that? I mean, you know, I think that there's a big chunk of this, which I see being so deeply involved in this every day, where we define standards, those standards aren't implemented in systems. They say they are, but they don't really work. And whenever you kind of press on that, the, uh, the answer always is they didn't ask for it. Our customers aren't demanding this. Yeah. And so a lot of what we talk about is, you know, kind of creating all of the Lego blocks that we saw but no one is demanding that the Lego blocks actually get assembled in a particular environment. So my question to you is how do we fix that? So I don't know, but I, it won't prevent me from talking. Uh, so the thing that comes to mind is that, you know, there, there are, there are things that are in the free enterprise domain and there are things that we need to standardize for the benefit of society. So the things I can, you know, sort of the comparison is, uh, you know, standards for voltage and frequency of power uh, in the power grid. We need to standardize that and you need to be able to test it and say this generator generates power that's, you know, compliant. The other, the other example is the, the interstate road system. Again, uh, a different quote comes to mind, which is that the, uh, a project that's for the public good by definition is something that nobody wants to fund. Because if, if, if there was, uh, if there was a benefit, a business benefit, then everybody would be, there, there would be a business, some business would jump in there to do it uh, because, of, because of the profit motivation. And that's a good thing. But, you know, coming back to the, to the road system, the idea is we, we do the roads and you had standards, you know, for how much, how thick the concrete had to be and how, how wide the lanes had to be on the, on the interstate. And those things were enforced at the time things were built. But then it's an error then though, to then start saying, well, uh, you know, can I only have one trailer trucks or two trailer trucks or can passenger vehicles only be, and, and what, what's the cargo look like in those things and what, you know, that now, now you're just interfering with, you know, what, what otherwise would be. And so I think the, the key is to hit the, the right mark to establish, you know, this, this public definition of standards that enables uh, a marketplace and then let the marketplace, you know, uh, take control and provide things that we wouldn't even dream of, uh, you know, from, from the initial, uh, establishment of the infrastructure. So I don't think I answered your question at all, but like I said, it didn't keep me from talking. So um, your turn, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you touched on everything that I think there is that um, amazing idea of where we wanna get to. Uh, and when I was in medical school, actually, there was a professor of mine that said, your eyes, and it sounds better in Spanish, but <laughs> she said, uh, your eyes can only see what your mind knows or understands. And in that saying, uh, I think I've been carrying that saying all over again, because we might not know, and we might not um, know the root of certain um, diseases and everything else. And humanly, it's impossible for us to know everything, as you mentioned, uh, as a physician to keep up with every new article that comes out and read it and take care of patients every single day, it's humanly impossible. So you're never going to be 100% up to date and we're expected to be up to date on everything. Um, but then we have that very important thing about giving that high quality care to the patients. 
and every physician that goes to medical school wants to do that. Yeah. But then you have the opposite side, which is the business, the hospitals, the clinics, the practices, the EHR vendors, um, everything that comes with intellectual knowledge. Your time as a physician to get to know your patient, to get to actually have those very deep conversations that could lead you to understand maybe what came around and how they ended up with a certain disease or their mental health nowadays and everything else. It's very limited by the number of patients you have to see every single day. And it's limited by the documentation and everything else that comes around. So I guess um, this piggybacks on the last question. It comes down to money, money and a business needing money and the physicians needing to be paid and everything in between. Um, so might not be, this could be an, also an impossible question as in how do we put together policies, uh, the idea of standardization and everything else and still make a profit for those businesses that need it, yet again, give those that need it the most, the patients, that high quality of care. Yeah. No, I, you're exactly right. And one of the... <clears throat> The thing that you know that that I'm aware of and have worked you know some somewhat with is is the whole idea of value based care, uh, so that it becomes uh, the business proposition is that I make more money as a hospital if I provide high quality care. Now, that's easy to say, and it, as you know, we've looked at value based care. It's it's really hard. Uh, because the value-based care really depends on your ability to measure quality. And today, quality measurements, they're, they're becoming ever more scientific and, and uh, well-stated. It still requires implementation by every individual hospital, and they ultimately decide what they're going to report and, and how they're going to report it. And so they might be, some are less honest and some are more honest about what's happening. I worry about unexpected consequences. So I'm going to share another personal anecdote. Same daughter that has rheumatoid arthritis had um, uh, had some uh, benign liver tumors that, that were removed. And a few days after that, she got severe, you know, pain, liver pain. Uh, and uh, she went back to the hospital and they kind of looked at her and said, you know, uh, we don't see, you know, anything very wrong. Maybe you just exercise too much. You did too much too early after your surgery. Uh, well, we went home and then it, it just got more excruciating, more excruciating. I mean, my daughter basically said, you know, this, this is bad enough. If I have to continue this way, just let me go. You know, I don't, uh, we took her back to the hospital. They, they, uh, you know, they, they did a, uh, they did more studies. They found out she had a low-grade fever and, and that her white count had gone from uh, like uh, 13 to 19. For those of you, that's, you know, significant increase in white count indicating some, some infection. Uh, so they started around antibiotics and they started on other things. Um, so what's obvious from the clinical course and from the measurements is that was a post-op infection. That doesn't show up in her chart because the punitive measures we have around reporting that, you know, my, my physician ratings go down and CMS would like to dock my pay because I had my, my infection count is higher. That never, that, that, that never made it to any of the, the measurements. And so, if we can figure out how to actually measure quality and pay for quality in an unbiased and subjective way, and I would argue that it's actually the same thing. That is what, what if we actually had that foundation of interoperable data, then quality assurance is just a program that I come and run in your institution. And it's not you collecting the data. I'm looking at the data you collected. I can dock you because you didn't collect the data that was needed. Uh, if and, and then based on the data that I do have, I can say whether you provided the proper care for this patient. Uh, and so that's how I see it evolving. 
but we have to, you're, you're absolutely on point. We have to have, uh, there, there has to be a financial, at least in our current, in our current system, there has to be, be a financial reason. The other thing I would add is um, I know about a decision support program that was implemented. It worked, it was better for the patients and it decreased the profit revenue for the hospital. And so they took it out. So we got to solve the problem of motivation. And that, you know, it's in, in, in earlier conversations, it was all about misaligned incentives and how do we align incentives. And that is the single biggest problem. We can solve the technical things if people fund us and, and we have the time to do it. It's, it's regulation and, you know, discussion and uh, making a plan to figure out how we create incentives for proper care. And if that happens, then people will fund interoperability because they will have a financial reason to do these things. And that is the single biggest challenge is, is getting incentives aligned with the funding and proper progress of uh, these kind of interoperability. So that's an excellent question, wonderful question. We're probably over time, way over time. You got the hook. You've had enough? Okay. <laughs>